Isn't that a lovely prelude? Very nice. Good morning, all. Good morning. It is good to gather as God's people in God's house. And did everybody get your, your package? So we are having Holy Communion this morning. We're using the blue book. So. Uh, I find it's, a, it's helpful to make sure you check your, check your little cup and make sure that you got the two layers separated so that you can peel off the top layer for the bread. And then, and then it's fairly easy to find the other one once the, once the top one is off. That's often the problem is you end up getting two layers instead of one. So, oh, the things we learn in the time of pandemic. There are announcements in the bulletin. Is there anything that needs to be noted that didn't make it in there? Nope. Well, yeah, our, our service is uh, the setting five, and we will begin with our hymn. And you'll note that all of our hymns uh, except, is that this first one? No, they're all out of the red book. Yeah, all three. So uh, if you just follow what's on the screen, it won't be confusing. But otherwise, if you need the notes, the notes for the hymns, because we have a couple that are a little less familiar, they are in the red book. Yeah, the first one. <laughs> the first one is not, not a terribly familiar one, but you'll find it's beautiful and easy to sing. I'm going to use my copy with the notes, because it is unfamiliar. So we begin with our opening hymn. Please stand.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. join together in the prayer of the day. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire only and only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we hear our first lesson. Good morning. 
first lesson this morning from on the 21st Sunday after Pentecost is taken from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 4. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by, down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured him out, himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for all of the transgressors. Here ends the first lesson. Our psalm is Psalm 91. Uh, I'll ask the congregation to uh, read the indented portion. We'll read it responsively. It begins at verse 9. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, and the Most High your habitation, no evil will befall you, nor shall affliction come near you. For God will give the angels change over, charge over you. To guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will, you will tread upon the lion, cub, and the viper. You will trample down the lion and the serpent. I will deliver those who cling to me. I will uphold them because they they will call me, and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. With long life will I satisfy them. And show them my salvation. Here ends the, the psalm. Our epistle lesson is taken from Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness and because of this he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor but takes it only when, God call, when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the lessons. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Gospel for this 21st Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 35th verse. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and asked to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to him, to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I will drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Christ. Christ. Please be seated. How about that name in the first lesson? Melchizedek or Melchizedek. You can pronounce it either way. Remember the story of that guy? interesting character shows up in one little story in the Old Testament and he is the priest of Salem which is an old name the name that later on became Jebus and then Jerusalem the priest of Salem the priest at Jerusalem and Melchizedek was a pagan priest because it was not at the time an Israelite city Abraham and his family came into the Levant, into the, the area of Israel, and they were sojourners in the land. They were wandering shepherds. And yeah, he had some influence, and he, he, had, he had some 
He had a big family, he had a bunch of servants, he had many slaves and many workers, and he had large flocks, but he was not a ruler in the land. He was passing through. He was promised this land, but it had not yet been delivered. And there was this battle where Abraham defeats a rival, he manages to get back his relative that had been captured, and the priest comes out from Salem, from the city, Melchizedek, and pronounces a blessing over him. That's all there is to the story. And we don't see anything else about this guy before or after. But it becomes a symbol of God's action in the world coming from unexpected places. In fact, coming from outside the designated family of God. God's action in the world is much bigger, sometimes bigger than we would prefer it to be. Here we have Abraham, the father of faith, the one who is traced as the, the originator of not just Judaism, but also Christianity and Islam also. So with these Abrahamic faiths, we're all blessed by a pagan priest. Interesting. God's blessings come from unexpected, surprising, outsider spaces. And here in our New Testament lesson, Paul is proclaiming that Jesus, or whoever wrote Hebrews, whether it's but that's that we don't really know who wrote the book Hebrews. But, you know, some people think it was Paul because he wrote so much. But whoever wrote the book of Hebrews is claiming that Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Just as it's, it's if he's poking a stick at those who are really, really concerned about orthodoxy and making sure all the theological T's are crossed and I's are dotted. According to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus is a high priest according to a pagan priesthood? God's action in the world is big. It's huge. He comes from unexpected places and from outsider spaces to bless us and to call us to something much bigger, much more surprising, much more powerful than could be even contained in our own rich heritage. God is active everywhere. And then we have this story of the Sons of Thunder, those firebrands, James and John, Remember the story where they're passing through this uh, foreigner village and James and John say, well, they didn't welcome us. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? These same guys, these are the guys. They're very, very zealous for their Lord and Savior, for Jesus. And Jesus says, that's, that's not what we're about here. And here, they show there, you know, they really want to be important people in the kingdom. In fact, well, there's, there's some possibility here that maybe their mom put them up to this. Because we have another story where their mom puts them up to this. And she's really wanting to know, you know like, her boys are special. And she knows how good they are. They're, they're, and they did turn out to be tremendous leaders in the church. But for some reason, they come to Jesus with this request. And can you just, I just hear sadness in Jesus' voice. Oh, you guys. And yes, you will be baptized with the baptism that Jesus will be baptized with. They too felt the power of the empire crashing down upon them. They too were persecuted. 
And yes, they drank the cup that Jesus drank from them. But it becomes an occasion for Jesus to talk about the way the kingdom of God works. No, yeah, I don't know if you noticed. I, sometimes I use that term kingdom. I pull out the G. It's not kingdom. Because kingdom implies a certain kind of rigid, top-down hierarchy. That there is one in charge, and that everybody else had better buckle down and crack to their work, or they will be crushed. But God's realm is more of a family, more of a kingdom than a kingdom. And Jesus does not use a lot of king language about God, but uses a lot of papa, a lot of family language. James and John, whether it's them or somebody else who put them up to it, see it as a very much a kingdom in terms of an ancient Near Eastern kingdom where you have one absolute ruler with absolute power and that power is not to be questioned. And Jesus says, you, you don't know what you're asking. It's not what you think. So Jesus sits down with these two who clearly didn't get it and with the other guys who by becoming angry at them for not getting it, they clearly don't get it either. And he has to explain, it's not like that. God is moving in a new way in the world. There is this new way of being that is breaking into the world. A way of being that is a servant leadership way that sees the opportunity to lead as being the most lowly position. The opportunity to lead is the opportunity to become the servant of all. And in fact, uh, servant is perhaps a little bit of a lightening of the language because it really is doulos, slave. The ones who are on the top if they see their role correctly, see themselves as being the foot washers, the pot scrubbers, the toilet cleaners, the servants, the slaves of all. And Jesus models this by reigning not from a golden throne, but from a cross. He is raised up, but he is raised up not to dominate, but to die. It's a different, topsy-turvy kind of world. Our world really hasn't got there. We still have leaders in so many places and in so many ways who consider their position of power as a place to benefit themselves and those close to them over the good of all the people. We get glimmers here and there, yes we do, of leaders who are truly trying to be servant leaders, who will literally lay down their lives. And we all have seen some of those in history. People who have spent time in prison trying to seek the freedom of their people and later on perhaps get the chance to become the president of a country. These are glimmers of God's kingdom. And when we see them, it's encouraging because God's way is continuing to break into the way of this world, is continuing to change and transform our reality into a reality that is not based on domination and power, but on compassion and care. For the Son of Man came not to be served, 
but to serve. Not to crush his enemies and smash the kingdoms that would oppose, but to give his life a ransom for many. Oh, it's challenging. Our flesh wants to look for our advantage in our own power, like James and John. But our hearts are called to this higher calling. And Christ continues to call us. And we have the opportunity to respond in small ways, in big ways, whatever ways we are given opportunity, we are assigned to the world as we lay our lives down for one another and as we are raised up to love one another more powerfully, more clearly, and more transformingly than the world could ever imagine. Amen. We turn to our hymn of the day, number 659 in the Red Book. together confess our faith in the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. <clears throat> we give you thanks, O Lord, that you call us to a new, a powerful, and a challenging way of being in the world, a way of being in the world that challenges all of the presumptions of power 
and a privilege, but calls us to love one another and even to love our enemies. We ask that you would inspire us and fill us with your spirit that we be given the grace and the joy of living this new way. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks, O Lord, for all the servant leaders whom you have raised up through time, those who have caught a vision of this way of leading. We pray that you would inspire new leaders to continue to rise up and to set people free, to give new hope to those who are crushed and to raise up captives. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for the joy of new life. And we ask your blessing upon Jocelyn and Michael as they enter into their new life as a married couple. Help us as your people to support them in all they do and in the days to come. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up before you all those around and among us who are struggling, who are in need, who are vulnerable. We pray for those who are finding it difficult to find resources in this challenging time of pandemic. We ask your strength, courage, endurance, and patience for those who have had a rather small harvest and who must see how to get through to next year. We give you thanks for the rain that has come this week to refresh the land, and we pray that you would continue to pour down your blessings upon us. We lift up before you those in our nursing homes. We pray for Edna Gessner, Doris Hansen, Ted Hubick, Irene Shira, Christine Schultz, Norman Sievert, Pauline Yauk, Evelyn Small, and Lavina Thompson. And we lift up before you all those whom you placed upon our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks for the example of those who've gone before us into their rest, walking faithfully by your side, serving and loving to the end of their days. May they be an encouragement to us in our walk. And may we, when you have called us home, be a good example to those who come after us of life in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share a sign of peace with each other as is appropriate. Peace be with you. Live long and prosper. At this time, we would traditionally pass the plate around. Of course, we're still not doing that. The plate is at the back. If you missed an opportunity and would like to make an offering, there's uh, the opportunity to place something in the plate at the back of the church as you're leaving. And uh, we welcome and uh, are appreciative of the gifts of those who join us, also not in person. If you wish to make a contribution, there are opportunities to do so on the website at uh, www.stjohnnarana.com and uh, we are grateful for all of those who are participating with us in supporting this ministry whether in person or through the internet we are glad to have you with us if you have not had an opportunity to do so before and you are joining us through video 
please take the time to pause at this time if you need to and prepare your materials as we are going to receive Holy Communion. As we come to the table, we come in gratitude as servants of the servant king, the one who has come to us and given us all. We practice an open table. All are welcome to come. So if you're joining us over the internet, please gather some bread and wine or as close as you've got. Let's not be picky. There, is a, there are been many traditions through the years that have used materials other than wine, red wine and bread. There have, uh, there have been all kinds of communion materials. Fish and honey, believe it or not, was used by some of the early communities in, uh, in, the, uh, in the very first years of the Christian church. Uh, isn't that interesting? So, we move into the next section of our worship as we recognize the gifts of God to us, which are all the things we have and all that we are. We join in our offertory. <laughs> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. your son who reached out to heal the sick and suffering who preached good news to the poor and who on the cross opened his arms to all 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this holy communion, we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. People of God, the body of Christ, broken for you. Beloved people of God, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his holy and precious blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace to life everlasting. Amen. We join into our post communion catechism. receive the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us that we may be filled with the power of his endless life now and forever. Almighty God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. We turn to our closing hymn, 620 in the Red Book. Serve the Lord.